So um, thanks very much uh, to the organisers for inviting us. I really, really enjoyed this conference so far, and it's been a, a really, really nice opportunity to go back to some of my um, re uh, YouTube research, but also to think about um, how I'm teaching um, research methods for studying YouTube. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about, um, about the latter, about actually teaching research methods. So, most of my YouTube research um, is from 2009 until 2011, and it's really concentrated in this project that um, I was at the time a researcher on, uh, working with uh, Lisa Consona and Sabina Michal, for a project that's called Fitna the Video Battle, how YouTube enables the young to perform their religious and public identities. So this is about a um, anti-Islam uh, film that was leaked onto the internet by right-wing politician Keir Builders. And what we were interested in is to examine YouTube as a kind of battleground for um, responses. Uh, because the mainstream media discussion around this video is very much about should the video be banned or not, uh, but it wasn't really about religion and there were, um, unsurprisingly perhaps, um, a very limited number of voices that were deemed um, appropriate or um, interesting enough to comment on this. And, and we saw YouTube as a really interesting site at the time where multiple different voices, including Muslims, young people, uh, were uploading responses. And so we ended up examining uh, 1,413 videos. So what I particularly took away from this project is the power of combining different methods and approaches to try and understand a complex phenomenon. Um, and so we ended up publishing um, four journal articles, uh, and there's some other articles and chapters that have come out of it, but we try to address different aspects of this, of this data set. So <clears throat> we did a content analysis of the Fitna video itself looking at how people are, different people are displayed in the video, but we also looked at a subset of these 1400 videos, 65 videos that were uploaded by women, and as Mike has already highlighted, at the time, it was a, you were able to um, make this selection based on gender, and now uh, the API um, has removed this. We also did a network analysis to try and understand who is commenting or what groups um, of people are kind of um, organized together and what does that mean and what kind of ties um, can you observe from that but also what kind of ties does the tool suggest are here and what kind of um, critical analysis might you need to kind of bring to that in terms of temporality or what you think this kind of connection between two different dots actually means if you apply maybe um, qualitative methods um, to think about, you know, friends, for example, or subscriptions. We also did a, a, genre, a genre analysis to try and understand what kinds of videos people were uploading. Were they, um, you know, vi extensive videos that people have made themselves, or were they um, short, um, sorry videos, for example, or were they, um, you know, predominantly text videos with voiceovers where people were, were responding. So we had um, different genres that we, um, we looked at. Vlogging, of course, was, was another one. And we also did a survey of the posters. Um, so we managed to get uh, 40 responses. This took us a really, really long time to, to get. And they were mainly from men. But we also wanted to understand why did people feel the need to upload response videos. So we had a, a quite um, an extensive approach to all aspects of this uh, response, and I think uh, was a was a very nice way of looking at this. So one of the other big takeaways um, from this project um, was working with Mike, who wasn't an official member of the team. But when I started on this project, there wasn't a tool that would allow you to download um, YouTube data, and so I put in a, a kind of a cry for help to Mike and. Um, he very kindly responded by building um, a new add-on to Webmatic Analyst, which actually allowed me to do this work. So Webmatic Analyst for YouTube is a, is a direct result of me basically saying, um, why isn't there a tool that can do this? Because trying to do this manually is really, really difficult um, for all sorts of different reasons. Um, you, you just can't hand code fast enough with the API restrictions. and. Um, the way in which the videos are displayed, even on an hourly basis, kept changing and it was making me crazy. So, Mike ended up building this tool. 
Um, and so beyond beyond the Finland project, Mike and I have done some um, some further work, and he's already discussed the paper and looking at comments because one of the things that I was really um, interested in is the way in which the field of research around YouTube was shaping at the time and this kind of perception that YouTube was this really negative space but that was largely driven by research on essentially very negative issues. I mean for us it was no surprise that a lot of the conversations around Islam were negative um, and therefore one of the things that Mike and I wanted to also look at is what does a, a kind of a general comment look like on average if you also include how-to videos and, and so on. Um, and, and I think that's really important to try and understand what is average um, versus what is the perception of a social space. So what I really want to kind of talk about um, now is how I've taken that, that research um, into my teaching. And so um, I've been doing research on social media for, uh, for over a decade now and for, since 2011 I've run a really popular module called Researching Social Media which is a 12 week postgraduate module. Um, which has really grown since I first started it in, two, in academic year 2011. Um, and so you can, you can see how over that period, um, and especially last year, all of a sudden there's just this huge jump from you know, over 50 students to 150, which um, you know, I sort of had to lie down for, for some weeks to recover um, from that intake. Um, and the prediction is that it's going to be 180 this year. So something is clearly happening that um, many, many, many more students are interested in understanding how do you deal with data from social media platforms. <coughs> so just as a tiny bit of background, um, most of these students come from data science, our data science program. I'm based in the information school, so most of the students come from one of the information school um, programs and it's also being offered to the journalism school. So it's a really nice mix um, of students. And this year it will also be offered to sociology. So it's a really broad mix of students who take this module. And with that in mind, um, I try and, and kind of cover a whole range of different methods um, for, for these students. Um, so this ranges from content analysis, both uh, textual and visual, and visual analysis is really, really crucial to, um, to my work. I'm, I also direct a research lab, but Mike is also part of the Visual Social Media Lab. So for us, trying to understand online visual cultures is, is really important. Um, and so students are exposed to um, content analysis and discourse analysis, both focused on text but also images. Um, they do some um, mini exploratory digital ethnography field work uh, with one of my RAs, Anne Burns. Uh, of course, social network analysis, sentiment analysis, we use Senti Strength, actor type analysis, uh, link analysis. Again, uh, Mike's tools are really useful. More broadly, digital methods, trying to think about medium specificity. So, this is really coming out of the work of uh, Richard Rogers and, and others. And also increasingly um, looking at memes, we use semiotics uh, and iconography. So it's a whole bunch of, of different methods. So one of the one of the key things um, in terms of teaching this module um, and then kind of moving towards talking about YouTube is to teach these students to think critically about the data they work with. Um, and that sounds easy, um, it isn't. Um, and I've experimented over the years with lots of different ways in which to train them to think critically about this data, um, specifically how the data is made. So to really get them out of this idea that data naturally occurs on these platforms, but to think about, um, and you know, yesterday Jean's talk um, already um, you know, set us up really nicely for thinking about these, uh, about these issues, but what, how can we think about the creation of data, the flow of data between platforms, users, APIs, the tools that are built on top of APIs, the algorithms uh, that um, run, run these platforms, so that students have a much more complex idea about where this data is coming from and therefore what they can do with it. Um, I also get them to really think about what is the data that they want or need, right? So one of the things with social media data is that there, um, something that can creep in is that students can't think beyond the data that is simply available through the API. And so what I really want them to think about is 
forget about what's available through the API, forget about the tool, first of all, actually think about what is the data that you need to answer your research question. Mm -hmm. If you cannot answer that, there's no point in a way to just start looking at a tool and start um, kind of churning out, churning out results, unless you're doing it in a very exploratory way, and unless you're doing that um, to, you know, to, to have other goals. But if you're trying to answer a specific research question through data, then you really need to, first of all, think about what it is that you, you need in order to answer that question. Then the second layer of that is in terms of data collection, what is actually possible, right? So once you've try to answer the question, what is the data that you need? The next immediate question is, is that data available? Is, that, is it possible to collect that data? And often the answer is no. Um, the next question, so we kind of go through this um, kind of decision tree process, is are there any tools that can help you? And often again the answer is no. Um, right, so this is kind of depressing stuff. Um, but what the, the kind of the core function of this thinking is, is to really move them away from tool-driven approaches. Um, and to really get them to think beyond what is simply available through APIs and tools. So one of the things that I've observed over, over the kind of the last five years of teaching this is that students tend to be much more keen to learn tools than they are to learn methods. Right? So what they want is kind of quick fixes that they perceive tools to offer. What they're not interested in, per se, is the kind of much more boring, hardcore kind of social science methods, um, and then to try and think about what is possible between, between these. Um, so they have a lot of assumptions about what the tools can do and how the tools can help them, um, and assumptions about what analysis the tool will do automatically for them. And so what creeps in very early on is this kind of deep disappointment at the realization that there's enormous limitations to these tools. And that a lot of the analysis um, has to be done by hand or has to be done in different ways or has to be done in, a, in, a, in, an, in an approach that means that there isn't one tool that's going to do everything, collect your data, analyze your data, and visualize your data. So what we, what we try and work through is to really think critically about what it is uh, that you need, what is the tool that you need, what you need it for, what can be done in the tool, and what may have to be done manually. Right? So it's just kind of trying to, first of all, map out your research design in this really critical way. Um, and um, they struggle with it, and they, they, they tend to not, not like it a bit. So, the reason for this, and this is again based on many years of teaching this stuff, is that if you start with teaching students tools, they cannot see beyond the tool. They really struggle to see beyond the tool because the tool often um, is very beguiling in terms of the visualizations that it may produce or what the tool can do, and it's very difficult to break them out of that tool kind of side of thinking and to just to. Um, snap them out of maybe you need different tools or maybe you need to you know, do part of your analysis manually. And it also becomes really hard to identify limitations. Because if you're really kind of only looking at one particular tool, it's very hard to imagine the wider landscape, the wider data landscape. Um, and so what the teaching approach has kind of developed into over the years is to try and get them to this critical level so that they can think beyond the tool and one of the things that I've been experimenting with in the last couple of years is to try and get them, first of all, to think about themselves as social media users before we move them into thinking about social media, uh, thinking about themselves as social media researchers. So one of the ways in which I've uh, done that in the last couple of years is to start them off on the web interface of the platform. So to look at the current, the contemporary web interface, um, and then uh, very much echoing um, uh, Jean's approach to also look at the history of, of um, the interface and to, to start to think about different key moments in the development of the platform that may or may not uh, be important and that may or may not give indications that the platform may change during the time that they're studying it. And this is also something that students often don't think about. And we've, heard already um, examples yesterday where the API changes and all of a sudden your data collection halfway through uh, your project you know, is, is affected in different ways. We also examine the API documentation if that's available uh, for the platform. 
And we also look at um, how a chosen tool works with the API. Because, of course, there isn't a seamless uh, duplication of what is possible in the API in terms of what is then possible in the tool. And again, for them to understand what is available in the API and what is available in the tool and why have tool developers made certain choices about what to collect from the API or not is another layer of getting them to think about that as well as to think about how sustainable a tool or an API might be. So tools break, and they can break for reasons of um, APIs being changed, but they can also break for reasons of cease and desist letters by Twitter. And there's many, many examples of this. Popper Keeper is one of the, the most well-known ones. But tools also, companies get sued, and tools die. Uh, and this is, you know, again, something that they really need to understand. So. One of the other things that um, we try and, and, and work through is once we get to the tool, is, is the tool performing in such a way that you were expecting, right? So is the tool doing what you hoped it would do? Is it fit for purpose? So one of the things that we did early, uh, early on with them is they wrote tool reviews and then they gave presentations um, and they interviewed each other about what these tools do and they make recommendations. So um, that was a, a really fun part, which unfortunately I had to uh, scrap because there's too many students now. Hmm. So, analyzing comments. So Mike's already um, talked through this um, in, a, in a really useful way, so I don't, I, I don't have to go through it in too much detail, but one of the things that um, I do with them is I go through the architecture of the comments for, for a number of different platforms because I want them to start to understand that these architectures are different that the affordances that are uh, available in the comment sections are different for different platforms, that sometimes comments are nested, that sometimes you are able to respond to comments, and that sometimes the platform calls something, what you would call a comment, a tweet. Right? So on Twitter, you don't have comments, except that when you look at the interface of Twitter, you can see underneath a tweet responses. And that's not what the API calls it, but maybe in your interpretation, you might say, but those are responses to a tweet, but that's not how the API treats them. So on Twitter is a really horrendous platform for this because the comments are all called the same. An original post and a comment, is, they're both called a tweet. So um, then what we look at is what does all this data look like in the API? Um, so, so Mike has already highlighted the drop in numbers of comments that you are able to get out of the API now. Um, so when I started doing this research, you could get a thousand comments, you could get the thousand most recent comments, and over time it has dropped. And so um, my understanding was that now it was around 150, and Mike's slides highlight is actually 100. So the number of comments you can actually get 